Okay, so in this video, I'm going to talk about loop pipelining, which is probably the single most important optimization that HLS systems do. And it's really critical to getting high performance with just about any real uh, program you're going to put through an HLS tool. So loop pipelining is a loop optimization. So let's just take a look at a very simple loop. Um, uh, and this is an embarrassingly parallel loop. It's a loop where every iteration of the body uh, is independent of the others. And basically, this function is going to take in two inputs, A and B. Um, and we're going to say for i equals 0 to 3, we're going to set ai to be bi plus 7. So just basically set ai to be each of the elements of b plus 7. And uh, this is implemented as one of the examples in our uh, demo HLS. And uh, well, let's see, loop add 7.c. Oh, I actually have a slightly different bound in this loop. Uh, the bound is 10 here instead of 3, but that doesn't really matter. So let's just run this. Um, ordinary loop schedule for this test case. And um, we're going to take a look at what the schedule looks like, and then we'll look at what's wrong with that schedule or inefficient about it and what we can do to fix that. OK, so well, first, let's look at what the LLVM for loop add 7 looks like. And so we've got the function, and then we enter the function and unconditionally jump to label 2. Here's label 2. And then in label 2, we basically, this sets the i variable to be uh, basically 0 if we came from the entry of the function, or i plus 1 if we came from the last iteration of the loop. So then we're going to do get element pointer on the index variable in b, which is basically just LLVM's generic um, address calculation instruction. And so we're going to basically compute bi, then we're going to load bi from memory, add 7 to what we just loaded, compute ai, store uh, the value we computed back to a sub i, then update the index variable, check the exit condition of the loop, and if the exit condition is true, go to label 1, which is the return label. Otherwise, go back to label 2 and uh, start a new iteration of the loop. So our states for this, well, state 0, we just do the unconditional branch into the loop. And then in state 1, we do some address computation and start loading bi. In state 2, the load finishes, because loads take one cycle, and we uh, start doing the add 7. And then that finishes in 0 cycles, because it's combinational. So we'll start the store. And then the store state takes 3 cycles. And by the time we get to state 5, the store will have completed for the first time, and we'll do the branch. And then 6 is the return state. And then the state transitions um, are at least a little interesting. We go from state 0 to state 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 5. Then in state 5, we're done with um, one iteration of the loop, right? And so if the exit condition of the loop is not true, we're going to loop back to state 1, which is the starting state of the loop. And if it is true, we're going to go to state 6, which is the end state. And we're just going to stay in state 6 um, indefinitely. OK, so that's our uh, loop schedule. What does it actually look like when it's implemented? Um, so if you um, take away like the LLVM address computation cruft, this is basically the loop body, right? We're going to load bi into a temporary, then we're going to add 7 to the temporary, to whatever the temporary value was. Then we're going to store that value back to ai, and then we're going to increment i by 1. And this is basically what the loop state numbering and schedule looks like. So for each instruction, I've got one of these sort of blue... Um, intervals that describes the length of the instructions. So the combinational instructions like adds take zero cycles, this load takes one cycle, and the store takes three cycles. We start the load in state one, then when it finishes, we start adding to seven to the value we just loaded, and that finishes instantly on uh, state two, and then we start doing the store instruction. Um, and then the store is progressing along. And uh, once we've started the store in the cycle after that, we can update i because that's the last use of i for this uh, loop. So what does actually executing this loop body schedule look like? Um, well, here's what it looks like. Basically, you just take this existing schedule and you repeat it you know, n times, where n is the number of iterations of the loop. So in cycle 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, we're going to complete the first iteration of the loop. Then in 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, we're going to complete the second iteration, then 8 through 12, the third iteration, and so on. And notice that, um, you know, in the original schedule, right, we have to get to state 5 before we decide to loop back. So um, each uh, iteration of the loop finishes before the next iteration starts, and you see that in this uh, diagram. 
Well, the problem here is that we're really only getting 25% utilization of our resources, right? So if you look back up at this timeline, um, you know, let's suppose that the RAM that we're loading from, like most RAMs, can handle one load being issued every cycle. We could issue a load in this cycle, then in this cycle, then in this cycle, then in this cycle, then in this cycle, but actually we only issue one in this whole range. And if you look around, actually in one, two, three, four cycles, we issue one load, and then in the next one, two, three, four cycles, we issue one load, and so on. And if you look at the utilization of the adder for this add seven op, it's the same story, right? In one, two, three, four cycles, we only issue one add. When, you know, assuming this is a pipelined adder, we could issue one add every single cycle. Or actually, it, it's not a pipeline adder, it completes in zero cycles. So by definition, we could issue a new op every cycle. And then it's the same thing for the store port and for the other adder, right? We're basically, in theory, we could issue a new op every cycle, but we're only doing so every four cycles. So what's the source of this problem and how could we fix it? Um, well... Basically, the source of the problem, and by the way, just to say about that issuing thing, it's not just possible for us to issue one load or one store every cycle. It's completely legal for us to do it, because if you remember, um, each of these loop body iterations is computing an operation that's independent from all of the other loop iterations. So, you know, this iteration is doing a computation that's completely independent of this iteration that's completely independent of this iteration. So there's no reason why we couldn't just push them all together and issue one load per cycle. But our current state machine only allows 25% utilization. And here's um, just another way of depicting that, right? So we're going to start iteration 0 at cycle 0, we're going to start iteration 1 of the loop at cycle 4, and then we're going to start iteration 2 of the loop at cycle 8, and so on. And the critical thing is that this distance, the distance between the start of one, of one uh, loop interval, or one loop, um, one instance of the basic bo of the body of the loop, and the next is the initiation interval. So in our case, the initiation interval here is four, right? It takes four cycles for uh, to go from the start of the first iteration of the loop to the start of the second iteration of the loop. And the most obvious way to get better utilization of our resources is basically just to narrow the initiation interval. So what we'd really like to do is just reduce the initiation interval to one. Um, so do a schedule that looks more like this. Um, so basically it's the exact same schedule, right? Each iteration has the same schedule, but we start the, f the first iteration of the loop, then one cycle later we start the second, then one cycle after that we start the third. So that we're doing a better job of overlapping operations and we're issuing one load per cycle, one add on this adder per cycle, one store on the store port per cycle, and so on. Um, and now our initiation interval is one, right? So whereas before it was four, now it's one. There's one cycle, um, or basically we're issuing a new um, iteration of the loop every single cycle. And now we've got 100% utilization, right? If you look back up here, for the time that we're using a loop, we're issuing one load every single cycle, store every cycle, adds every cycle, and so on. So we're getting perfect utilization, and that's awesome. Um, there is some complexity in... Uh, basically adding a more complicated state machine. And there's actually also another catch, which is memory dependencies. And memory dependencies are really the thing that make pipelining tricky, and they're complicated enough that I'm actually going to do a different video on memory dependencies to explain them. But for now, what you need to know is basically um, the default loop behavior that you get in these kinds of finite state machine schedules doesn't lead to very good performance because the loop iterations have a very large initiation interval. And pipelining is an optimization that basically creates a more elaborate state machine with a smaller initiation interval where subsequent iterations of the loop are actually overlapped in time to get better utilization of functional units. And we'll talk more about how that actually works and when it isn't possible in subsequent videos.